big announcement, big endorsement, guys. This one is a real game changer. Wait for it. Jeb Bush endorsing Ron DeSantis. Take a listen. Is this Ron DeSantis' opportunity to run for higher office? I think it is. He's been a really effective governor. He's young. I think we're on the verge of a generational change in our politics. I kind of hope so. I think it's time for a more forward-leaning, future-oriented uh, conversation in our politics as well. Which has made him, should he choose to run for president, a serious contender in Republican politics. And who better to do it than uh, someone who's been outside of Washington, who's governed effectively, who I think has shown that Florida could be a model for the future of our country. I DeSantis mean, has got to be like, yeah, he'd no, be like, why stop. would I want that? He'd be like, she should call oh, him up no. and be like, hey, man, <laughs> shut your mouth. This is actually not helpful to me <laughs> at all. That said, I mean, it illustrates the fundamental problem that he has, which is that the people who want him to win and to run the most are anti-Trump people in the Republican Party. But if he ever wants to win the Republican nomination, he would have to be a person who's able to unite the Trump side and the anti-Trump side. Worse, the anti-Trump side, as you can see there, has yet to coalesce around a single person. You have Nikki Haley in the race. Mm -hmm. You have Vivek Ramaswamy, who's now in the race. We'll see how he ends up um, in the polls. I'm actually curious to see if he's even able to make a dent. But you have Mike Pence here jockeying uh, for the nomination. You have M Mike Pompeo, John Bolton, all these other characters, Asa Hutchinson. Mm -hmm. uh, they're considering Glenn throwing Yankin. their ring in the uh, their hat in the ring. Mm -hmm. You know what? Especially, mm -hmm. I think Mike Pence, given his standing, we shouldn't forget. He's the only one who has a real organic constituency in the Republican Party. It's evangelicals. Yeah. And also, though, Pence is still aligned with the old GOP. Pence has already come out and said, "No, I think we should cut Medicare and Social Security." And Ukraine is now becoming a massive dividing line in the party. Vice President Mike Pence actually hit Ron DeSantis, not Trump, specifically DeSantis, whenever it came to his stance on Ukraine, questioning why President Biden was in Kyiv whenever he was needed here at home. Here's what Vice President Pence had to say. While some in my party have taken a somewhat different view, let me be clear. There can be no room in the leadership of the Republican Party for apologists for Putin. There can only be room for champions of freedom. And so the reason we know that's a shot at Ron DeSantis and not at Trump, who has actually gone further than mm -hmm. DeSantis in terms of his Ukraine comments, is because he made sure to say that Russia didn't try to seize territory during the Trump Pence administration and uh, praised, you know, Trump in, in other ways basically was touting their record as opposed to what DeSantis has been saying on it's, Ukraine. It's like this this shows you too where the infighting of all of this is replicating the exact 2016 conditions, which if Marco Rubio had dropped out of the race or John Kasich much earlier in the cycle, then, you know, Ted Cruz would have had a shot. I wouldn't say he would have won, but he might have come much closer to winning the nomination. But these people are all such narcissists that they're like, no, it's my turn, it's my turn, it's my turn that they're splitting up the anti-Trump vote, cannibalizing themselves, and not a single one has yet to criticize Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Mike Pence cannot say anything bad about Trump. Vivek Ramaswamy was asked on Sean Hannity. He said, I consider President Trump a friend. Uh, and I'm like, okay, maybe. Nikki Haley, I'm not kicking sideways. I'm kicking forward, because <laughs> she's always kicking. At a certain point, you have to run against this man, because trying to cannibalize each other's anti-Trump votes, of which is barely even exists as a lane for one individual, yeah. let alone five individuals, good luck. And also, you know, you have to say this, on Ukraine, DeSantis and Trump are clearly the ones who are on the right side of this with the Republican base. Like the number of people who are like rah rah NAFO pro Ukraine is under 50% in the Republican Party. So if you're fighting for those scraps, I mean, good luck. I thought it was significant that DeSantis adopted the same posture as Trump. Because there, you have, what, 75% right now of Republican of the re two Republicans that are polling at the very top yeah. in terms of support yeah. who are both adopting the same line on Ukraine. That's it. Yeah. That's an ideological victory. You yeah. can clean up. Absolutely. Yeah. And and there's new reporting that this isn't really surprising given the way that Ron DeSantis pos positioned himself when he was in Congress. But this is a new evolution yes. for him. Um, Andrew Kaczynski over at CNN tracked down his previous statements on uh, the situation in Ukraine. The headline here as Ron DeSantis wanted to send weapons to Ukraine when he was a congressman. As a presidential hopeful, he questions U.S. involvement. And basically, you know, when he was in Congress, it was like the Obama era. Mm -hmm. And this was his critique of Obama was that he wasn't being hawkish enough. He wasn't doing enough to arm Ukraine. And so he said, you know, a lot uh, in that direction at that time. 
Um, here's one, uh, one quote from the article. They say, once an advocate of a hardline hawkish approach to Russia by supporting Ukraine, the Florida governor shifted course this week in anticipation of a potential presidential run, questioning whether it was the U.S.'s interest to be involved in what he called things like the borderlands or over Crimea. He added that Russia was not the same threat to our country, even though they're hostile, and downplayed the threats that Russia could invade NATO countries. However, at the time, he described himself as a follower of the Reagan School of Foreign Policy. He said some things like, I'm an old, unreconstructed. Yeah. you know, Cold War kind of a guy, basically. Um, he said they viewed guys like me who are more of the Reagan school that's tough on Rush Russia as kind of throwbacks to the Cold War. They criticized Mitt Romney in 2012. Now, all of, all of a sudden, because they're using it against Trump, they're so concerned about Russia. Um, he also talked about he was critical of Obama refusing to provide, quote, lethal aid to Ukraine. They were trying to do a reset. The Democrats lauded that. So in any case, you can see that he can read the political writing on the wall and is definitely trying to shift his position from the way he positioned himself during the Obama era. One of the things that surprised everybody in DeSantis, look, I remember DeSantis as a congressman. He was remarkable in literally no way whatsoever. He was a replacement level Tea Party guy. Nobody here thought about him at all. Then he ran for governor and people were laughing at him because they didn't think he was going to win. At the time, he was like 35 points down. He ended up finagling a Trump endorsement. He ends up barely squeaking by in 2000. People, I don't think people remember this. It came like almost near a recount with Andrew Gillum. Yeah. That that's how close that race was. And then he shocked everybody. He did a couple of things before COVID, even before all of that. He increased teacher pay, started preserving the Everglades. And we were like, huh, this is an interesting guy. He's not the Tea Party person that he once was. He always wanted to be a very popular figure. COVID, he found his lane. Florida, the economy is booming. You have one of the largest net migrations in the entire United States. And now he's a major cultural figure. He's picked the cultural right. Um, he's picking a lot of the battles that people online are really jazzed out about in the in the Bay and also, from a general population perspective, clearly something compelling is happening in the state of Florida. I think he's ultimately just a political wins guy. He was a Tea Party guy mm -hmm. whenever he needed to be Tea Party guy. Mm -hmm. Now he is this, you know, Ukraine skeptical person when he wants to be. Now, for those who are uh, worried about that, that's not the worst thing in the world. Somebody who's willing to change their minds who's not ideological is in many cases, as you can see here, at least in my opinion, much better of a political ally than somebody like Pence who is doctrinaire, you know, an actual Reagan Republican in his mind. At the same time, if the winds blow the other way, that's clearly where he would go. I, I think of it as more politically significant that he did end up here on Ukraine and that at this point, if it is Trump or DeSantis, I'm not going to say you're going to get the same policy, but the same rhetoric and valence is now there. And clearly that ideological victory has been won on the Republican nominee side as even though there are all these GOP congressmen and all those who are beating the war drum in Ukraine, there, at least rhetorically, it's not there. Policy-wise, I still have no idea who he would pick yeah. or who would work for him. So right. anyway, I think it's I think it's very significant. Well, we also have to say that yeah. we, what we saw with Trump and what we've seen with all yes. kinds of political candidates is what you say on the campaign trail may end up be very, being very different oh, yeah. from what you do when you're governing and you've got the generals telling you this and you've got the donor class telling you that, and there's a lot of pressures that come to bear on you. You and you know the voice of the people that you that originally elected you becomes smaller and smaller and smaller <laughs> apparently. Um, but I do think that the fundamental issue for Ron DeSantis right now, who you know has a genuine base of support, he's not like a Jeb. He's not you know yes. I don't want to like diminish him like that. It, it, he definitely has uh, really captured the imagination of some subset of the Republican primary caucus. But um, you know if they're all afraid to tackle to go after Trump. And they're not afraid to take shots at Ron DeSantis, clearly. You are back in this 2016 dynamic where they're all jockeying to be number two. But guess what? Number two doesn't matter. Number one matters. And if you don't have a plan to get past Trump, he's not going to magically just disappear or disintegrate. You know, if you're waiting for this guy to just, like, self-immolate and go away, <laughs> dream on. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess, you know, it's theoretically possible, but you better have a plan to actually win. Here's the latest uh, polling that we've got. This is from Fox News. And, you know, again, his polls have been all over the map, so just keep that in mind. But uh, right now we've got Trump at 43, DeSantis 28, Nikki Haley with her little announcement bounce getting up to 7 percent, tied now with Mike Pence at 7 percent. And then you've got a bunch of, you know, uh, other contenders at 2 percent and 1 percent. So that's basically what the race looks like right now. And 
you know, we've we showed you last week some signs that Trump has actually gone up in the polls a bit, strengthened <laughs> yeah. his hand a bit over the past number of weeks. And I just continue to believe that the time when he was weakest was right after the midterms. Midterms feel like a long time ago. All of the freshness of like, oh, this was a referendum on Trump uh-huh. and this didn't go well and DeSantis did really well on Florida. It's kind of fading into ancient history already. Yeah, look, I mean, the polls, they're all over the map. At the same time, uh, all but one, I believe, I think 99% of them have Trump at the top. So Mm -hmm. that means something. What else do they show us? Mike Pence has the most static number across these I've ever seen. He's almost always at 7 to 11%. Yeah. It's like 7 to 11. So exactly, that's about, you know, the hard right evangelicals. That's about what they compromise of the Republican base. Okay, that makes sense. And the rest of it is just totally up for grabs between Haley, Abbott, Cheney, Kirstie Noem, Mike Pompeo, Tim Scott, Glenn Youngkin, Chris Christie, Larry Hogan, all these people, but all of them still don't even add up to anything close to what DeSantis or Trump has to. And, you know, Pence is not wrong. The greatest threat to him is not Donald Trump. It's Ron DeSantis. Nikki Haley, the greatest threat to her is Ron DeSantis or a Mike Pence. It's the anti-Trump, Trump Trump skeptical vote of which they are going to be, so they're really going to be vicious and trying to tear each other apart. And then all that does is benefit Trump, who's sitting pretty all the way up at the top with a near majority, near outright majority in many of these polls. It's a, yeah. it's a bad situation for many of them. Hey guys, ready or not, 2024 is fully upon us now. And Sagar and I have been brainstorming ways that we can really up our game for this critical election. Yeah, we rely on our premium subs to expand our coverage, to add staff, to upgrade the studio. We just want to give you the best independent coverage of this election, which is possible. So if you can help us out, become a premium subscriber today, breakingpoints.com, or the link is down here in the description video. It really means the world to us. And if you like what we're all about, this is the best possible way to keep us 100% independent, working only for you.